took a child and put it in the midst of them and taking him in his arms. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I'll turn my microphone down just a little bit. And note that we have a number of children in our congregation today. Uh, BJ didn't have a, a bunch of takers for kids' time. I guess they wanted to hang out and come listen to my sermon. So God bless you, children. Thank you for being with us. <laughs> Amen. I've been thinking all week about seeing the world with heavenly eyes. What does it mean to see the world with heavenly eyes? And the reason I've been thinking about that is because our collect today puts that in our hearts and in our minds to be thinking about heavenly things as opposed to earthly things. I love taking a look at the collect. And if you want to take a look at it with me, you got to flip back to the beginning of your bulletin. It's that prayer that we say at the beginning of the service after we say the Lord be with you and also with you when we pray the collect for the day. Now the collects for the day are all listed in the Book of Common Prayer. We don't get to choose them. They're appointed for each and every Sunday. And as I'm holding this up, let me just say one thing about the Book of Common Prayer. This is more than just a set of prayers. Personally, I can tell you that the story of my life is written in the pages of this book. I was baptized to the words in this book. I received First Communion to the words in this book. I was married to the words in this book. We buried my father to the words in this book. I was ordained as a deacon and a priest to the words in this book. I buried, uh, let's see, I buried my grandparents to the words in this book. I baptized my children to the words in this book. And when I die someday, I'll be buried to the words of the book of common prayer. The story of my life is written in the pages of this book. And it also contains some of the most powerful words that we hear, for example, in this collect. It says, grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. You gotta use your mental tweezers when you take a look at a collect from the Book of Common Prayer, because each and every word is packed with spiritual and biblical meaning. Take, for example, just that first line, grant us, O Lord. Does anybody know the difference between a loan and a grant? What's the difference between a loan and a grant? A loan, you gotta pay back. A grant, you don't pay back. It is a free gift. We're asking God not for a loan, but for a grant. And the passage from James contains a very powerful verse, verse two of chapter four of the book of James. It's an inspiring verse and a haunting verse, at least for me, because it says, you have not because you ask not. The Bible says that God our Father wants to give his children good gifts because he loves us. But how often have we thought, well, God knows what I need. God knows the troubles that I'm going through. God knows this thing in my life that I really wish I were different. Let me ask you a question. I ask it to myself as well. Have you gotten on your knees and asked God in the name of Jesus to remove that barrier or to make that change in your life? The book of James says that sometimes we have not because we ask not. Well, we're asking in this collect, grant us, Lord. Grant us what? Not to be anxious. Well, let me just stop right there. Not to be anxious. You know, I was looking up the word for anxiety in the New Testament. It's a Greek word called merimnao. Merimnao, which means literally to be divided, to be distracted, or to be pulled apart. And you know exactly what this is like if you have ever been anxious about something and you're having a conversation with somebody else and you see their mouth moving but you're not registering anything that they're saying because in your head, you are churning over this thing that you are anxious about. You're distracted, you're divided, you're being pulled apart. And in this prayer, it says, what are we anxious about? Earthly things. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things. What are earthly things? Well, we all have them. Job, house, condo, apartment, school, kids, 401k, car, all the things in our lives that demand our attention. Somebody once told me that in terms of advertisements, uh, the average American is confronted by 5,000 advertisements a day. We've got a lot coming at us. There are a lot of earthly things to be concerned about. You say, well, so what are you saying, Father Matthew, that we're not supposed to care about earthly things? We're all supposed to sort of move to a mountaintop and just remove ourselves from the world? Not possible, right? Look at the rest of the prayer. It says, but to love things heavenly. 
not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. So there's a distinction being made between earthly things and heavenly things. And let me put it this way. We are to attend to earthly things, but we are not to love them. We are to love things heavenly. We are to attend to earthly things because they demand our attention, but we are to love things heavenly. You look at the great heroes of the Bible, Moses and Ruth and David and Mary and Jesus. They were all confronted with earthly things that demanded their attention. Moses had to lead a people out of a country into the promised land. Uh, Ruth had to put together her whole family. Uh, David had to lead the people of Israel. Mary had to bear the very Son of God. These are earthly things that demand attention. But what did they love? They loved heavenly things. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. So what does it mean to love heavenly things? It means to be a person, a man or a woman, after the heart of God. To love that which God loves. To see how God sees. To be attended to the things that God is attended to. To see the world more like the eyes of God. And that's what it means to have a heavenly perspective. So the gospel reading today, Jesus takes, you know, a child, puts it in the midst of them. The disciples had been arguing about which one is the greatest, and Jesus puts a child right in their midst. What's he saying? Why does he do this? Well, children back then, as you know, were sort of dispensable. They were to be seen and not heard, or maybe not even seen at all. And so Jesus takes a child and he puts it in the middle of them, and he says, look, the world has a very low opinion of this child, and I say that this child is of infinite worth. And so you look out at the world, and you see the world has a certain opinion about things, and then there's Jesus' opinion about these things. Something totally dispensable, but in Jesus' opinion, totally infinite worth. And you start to see the world through the eyes of God, through heavenly eyes. What does it say in the rest of the passage? Even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away. Let me just say one thing about being placed. I firmly believe that each and every person here and each and every person watching on YouTube has been placed in that location by God for a purpose and for a reason. I grew up in Norwood, Massachusetts, a little suburb, then I was in Florida for a while. Uh, I never thought that Washingtonian would be on my list of credentials. But here we are, Danielle and I have been placed in this place because God has work for us to do and he loves us. In the Bible, it says that God formed the man, Adam, out of the dust of the earth and breathed life into him, into his nostrils, and then planted a garden in the east and took the man and what? Placed him in the garden. And you too have been placed here for this time and for this purpose, and God's got work for us to do, and he loves us. So you've been placed in the DMV for a reason. Even now, as things are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So what it says is that Christians are to see the world differently, to see the world as God sees the world. And you're saying, Father Matthew, you're trying to say that Christians are better people than non-Christians? I'm not saying that at all. Because I know plenty of non-Christians who are far more loving, compassionate, thoughtful than I am. But I am saying that Christians see the world differently. Amen? It's because we have different citizenship. We are citizens of heaven. You know, a lot of people go through life thinking that they are citizens of earth, and depending on how well they behave on earth, they will someday be granted residency in heaven. The Bible says it's the exact opposite. We are citizens of heaven already, which determines how we behave as residents of earth. Because we see the world through the eyes of God. So I'm just going to offer sort of two take-home examples, two practical examples. You say, Father Matthew, how does this work out in current life? I think that when you see the world with a heavenly perspective, you see other people differently. And secondly, I think you see yourself differently when you see the world through a heavenly perspective. But what about other people? 
Well, the fact is that each and every person that we run into on a daily basis is potentially somebody we're going to be standing next to in heaven. And it is absolutely somebody for whom Jesus Christ gave his life. Everybody's important. That's why Jesus takes the child and puts it right in the middle and says, the world says, not important, I say, infinite worth. It's an old story about a Harvard Business School, and a professor is there teaching the students, future CEOs of America, and professor says, final exam, take out a piece of paper. Professor says, question one, for 100 points. You've been coming to this class for 12 weeks, you've been coming in through the same doors, walking down the same hallway, and you've been passing our wonderful custodian who cleans this building. For 100 points, what is that person's name? He said, if you're going to be the future leaders of America, you have to understand that every single person is important. Now, that's a business model, but the Christian model takes it to another level. Because the Bible says that every single person is made in the image of God and Jesus Christ died on the cross for every man, woman, and child. And therefore, every person is not only important, but of infinite significance. And so when we put on the eyes of faith, when we see the world the way that God sees the world, we begin to see people the way that God sees them, as infinitely important, as made in the image of God, as beloved. What about how we see ourselves? How do we look at ourselves with the eyes of God? We see ourselves as being flawed and broken. We are. But do we also see the way that God can work through us for his glory and his purposes? That's right. Because he loves us and he can use us. And fractured though we are, sinful though we are, we are redeemed through the blood of Jesus Christ and he wants to use us for his glory and for his purposes and for the beauty of this world. It's an old story, an old parable that comes to us from Asia. It's the story of a clay pot that was suspended by a rope. The rope was attached to a wooden bar, at the other end of which was another rope and another clay pot. So this was a yoke that a servant used to carry water from the village to the river and back. You've probably seen pictures of this. Well, the story's not about the servant. The story's about the pot, because the pot had a crack in it such that it would leak a little bit of water, one step, one drop at a time. Such that when the servant went down to the river and came back to the village, about half of the water in that pot had leaked out. And this went on day after day, year after year, journey after journey. One day, by some wonder, the pot was given eyes to see and ears to hear and lips to speak. And the first thing the pot said was a confession. Oh, servant, I am so sorry. For all these years, I have been making your life more difficult, losing all this water, so that by the time you get back, you only have half as much as you should have. The servant said to the pot, Oh, but I see it completely differently. Use your eyes and look down the path. The pot looked and saw that on one side of the path was empty, and on the other side of the path, his side of the path, there was a long and continuous line of wildflowers. Because that side of the path had been watered step by step, drip by drip, week by week, month by month, year by year, from an old, broken, cracked pot. How often do we look at ourselves and see our weaknesses as debilitating? And we fail to see that God sees us and can use even our weaknesses for his glory and for his purposes. Yeah, we're sinful. Yeah, we're broken. And God wants to help us work on that. And God wants to forgive us of our sins and bring us into redemption with him. But he can even use our weaknesses for his glory. And it's grace. It's grace. Free gift. It's not a loan. It's a grant. I'll tell you one more story about grace, and then I'll close up. My uh, wife buys milk in glass bottles. So good, right? 
And because she is a better person than I am, she returns the bottles to the store where she got them and uh, makes sure she gets her you know, deposit back and gets the bottles refilled. So she had three of these empty bottles the other day and was going into the store. And sure enough, she was carrying a bunch of other stuff and she dropped one of the milk bottles, landed on the concrete, shattered into a million pieces. You know those moments where something breaks and you think, oh, maybe I could, and then there are other moments where it's just disaster. So two employees came running out of the store and they saw what had happened and they said, don't worry, we'll get it, we'll get it, don't hurt yourself, don't pick it up, don't cut yourself. And she said, ah, it's all my fault, I was carrying three things at once, I, you know, please, let me, you know, let me. she was embarrassed. And they said, oh, don't worry, we'll give you your deposit back, we'll get you a new milk bottle. And she said, no, 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 it's my fault, it dropped, you know. So she goes into the store and she's doing her shopping and uh, she gets a tap on the shoulder and it's one of the employees and the employee said, here's a gift card for $2.50. It's your deposit back from the uh, broken milk bottle. She said it was my fault that it broke and instead of me owing the store $2.50 or more, they gave me a gift card for $2.50. She came home and told me the story. She said, Matthew, I think that's a story about grace. I said, yeah, I think it is. We're not asking for a loan. We're asking for a grant. And God has already granted it to us, and that is grace. Colic for the day. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those things that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.